I want to ask you a question this morning. As you think about Jesus, of course, probably all of us would say, if you were asked, do you love Jesus? We would all say, yeah, I love Jesus. If you said, well, what do you know about Jesus? I suspect there would be a lot of things that each of us could share that we know about Jesus, right? And most of us would probably immediately run to the Gospels and say, well, I, let me share about Jesus. We would think about the Gospels and how those are four different portraits of Jesus in his life here on earth. Uh, maybe if you've been a Christian for longer and studied more, maybe you would think about going back to the Old Testament and looking at some of the pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ or the Isaiah 6 where he's seated on a throne and high and exalt, the train of his robe filling the temple, or you might go back to a lot of the appearances of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament are really pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ. But a book you might not think about as much is the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation. Because this morning we're going to start a book study through the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is a revelation of, anyone know? Jesus. Of Jesus. The book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus. You see, sometimes we get real familiar with Jesus and his life on earth. Maybe less familiar, but still somewhat familiar of Jesus' life before he became a man, but while he functioned in, oftentimes, in the idea of the angel of the Lord type thing in his pre-incarnate state. But maybe where we least think about Jesus is what the book of Revelation says about Jesus, because sometimes when we think of the book of Revelation, what are some of the things that people often think of when they think of the book of Revelation and maybe why people avoid it? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Hard to understand. Hard to understand. There's dragons, there's symbols, there's also, there's all kinds of craziness going on, right? In fact, there's craziness going on that would rival any Hollywood movie about Aliens or anything else. Some of the pictures of angels in there are not unlike some of the craziness of Ezekiel 1, right? And the judgments in there, in there rival the judgments of Genesis when God literally wiped out mankind with a flood. And so there's, it's a pretty crazy book and there are all kinds of interpretations. I can remember buying a bottle of water from a homeless man down at 59 and uh, uh, on my way to, to seminary years ago, and uh, he, I bought a bottle of water for me. He said, oh, let me give you this. And he was handing out what his perception of the end times, and it was a whole chart, and I was like, wow, a dollar water, and I get a whole chart of eschatology everywhere uh, you, uh, where human, humankind is going. I mean, it was crazy, right? And so there's just a million views out there on eschatology. And so that also helps us kind of go, the book of Revelation, just hard to understand. I'm just going to avoid it. But I would encourage you that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ as well as his future plan in many regards for what is coming as well as how does he view the church. A lot of times we look at and say, well, what does God think about different churches? There's all kinds of different churches. There's big churches and small churches. There's middle-sized churches. There's churches that believe this and believe that and everything. But what would Jesus say about all these things? And really, the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 really give Jesus' opinion on seven literal churches of his day. And you can really get a real comprehensive view of what Jesus thinks about churches today simply by getting an understanding of what he liked and didn't like in those seven churches. But we're going to start this morning uh, this book study with the author. Who, who knows who authored the book of Revelation? John. John. King James. King James. <laughs> but if you missed the equipping hour, we had a very funny, uh, elements were very funny of the video this morning. It wasn't King James, but good guess. It was John. John also wrote, wrote the book of... John. That was a tough one, but I, I knew somebody would, would, would pick up on this one. So, But the book of Revelation would, was written by John, Jesus' most beloved and trusted friend. In fact, this is how close John and Jesus were, that upon the cross in John 19, 25, um, in fact, he says this, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved. 
standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. That's how close they were, right? Jesus is dying. And he says to John, the one he loved, the one he was most close with, he says, Behold your mom. I'm dying. You take care of her as your own mom. He turns to his mom and says, Mom, he will take care of you as a son. He fully trusted that John would take full care of loving and caring for his mom, right? In fact, throughout the book, it says John, the disciple, calls John the disciple whom Jesus loved. You see, like any structure, there was a, Jesus had the masses that listened to him. He had the 70, if you'll remember him sending them out, and they were close with Jesus. More intimately, he had the 12, but most intimately, he had the three. John was one of those three. He was very, very close with Jesus. He loved Jesus. If you could talk to your best friend today, if we could ask your best friend about your life, would they know something about your life? They would probably know things about your life that no one else would know, right? They would probably bring up things that you would be embarrassed to, right? They'd be like, oh, don't, don't ask my best friend because they know me too well. If you had talked to the best friend of Jesus during his time here on earth, it would be John. It would be John. And John not only was the closest to Jesus, as you can tell from how Jesus treats him in the end. In fact, in John 21, 20, he says a very similar thing. He says, Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, speaking of John, right? Over and over, he mentions it that way. But Jesus, John loved Jesus and um, had really given up everything to follow him. Do you remember John's profession before he started following Jesus? He was a fisherman. In those days, the father would basically turn his business over to his sons, and they would continue, and then his sons uh, would follow. And so John's father ran a fishing business. John was a fisherman. But instead of taking over the family business, he walked away. And in walking away, it would go to the next son. And he was basically walking away from his livelihood to go follow Jesus. So it cost him a lot to follow Jesus. I don't know what it cost you to follow Jesus, but it cost John a lot. And ultimately, not only did it cost him a trade and cost him a family business, but ultimately he would suffer much too. You see, John, the last of the apostles, all the others were martyred. History tells us that John was actually boiled alive and he didn't die. Have you ever been burned, right? I was welding the other week, and my wife was like, I didn't even tell her I wasn't using gloves, man. I still got the scar on my hand, and I was wearing socks instead of boots with like, yeah, dumb idea, and two pieces of slag burned my foot, and I didn't tell her that either, but she already caught me doing it without welding goggles. I was like, you know, it was like, the whole thing was going bad for me, so I didn't tell her, but I was thinking, man, that one little piece of metal that burned my hand, I was like, that hurt. Like, without my wife's knowledge, I was running under water, holding a frozen bag of vegetables behind my back, you know, the whole nine yards. Because she's usually on my case about all this safety first stuff anyway, so I try to hide any of those type of things. But one little burn, and I was like in pain. Can you imagine John was boiled alive and it didn't kill him? When it didn't kill him, he was exiled to an island called Patmos, uh, basically a rock island that uh, they would put prisoners on. Now, it also should tell you something. We say that Jesus has control over all things. A lot of times in our prosperity gospel culture, we believe that if you follow him faithfully, he's going to make everything go smoothly for you. John, his most faithful disciple. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, Felicia's oldest son uh, took a whole bunch of medicine this morning. They think tried to commit suicide. He's in the hospital. I don't know if we could pray. Yeah. Let's, I just found out. I'm so sorry. No, let's pray for Deshaun. He, 
he's in the hospital and apparently uh, took a bunch of medications this morning and uh, they've rushed him to the emergency room. We pray, Lord, for Deshaun right now that you'd spare his life, that you would just intervene in that situation. God, cause him to look to you, cause him to turn to you, spare his life, God. May this be a turning point in his life. Please help them. Please help Felicia and their whole family. I'm sure they're panicked right now on this whole thing. Help them all to look to you. I pray this would be just uh, uh, something that you would use and turn this tragedy around for your glory and that you would uh, preserve his life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. No, thank you for bringing that up. So we're looking at John and we're looking at someone who suffered greatly and this was Jesus' closest companion, someone that Jesus loved greatly, someone that loved Jesus greatly. So we need to not evaluate whether God loves us by whether he lets difficulty happen to us. We need to evaluate whether he loves us based on what he said in the Bible. And what he said in the Bible is he loves sinners like us. If we've come to him to seek his forgiveness, he always stands ready and willing to forgive us, and he loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so we can look at what he did for us on the cross and say, he loves us, right? Well, he writes this book, and uh, so in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 1, he says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus to us. What is Jesus like right now? What is his future plans? All of this comes together in the revelation, not revelations. It's not a plural revelations. It's revelation. It's one revelation. And so the book of Revelation is the revealing to us of Jesus Christ. And so he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. By his bond servant, John. So revelation or the apocalypse, as some of your translations may have it, which means he's going to tell us all that's going to happen in the end. Now, I don't know if you ever, in college, I would often read the first and last chapters if I was really behind and I was like, I had a book stacking up. You can tell a lot by a book by reading the first and last chapters, right? The same is true of the Bible. If you get the first and the last chapters right, you can understand a lot of what's going on in the Bible. And so he's telling us this apocalypse or this revelation he has given to John, his best friend while he was on this earth, what is going to happen and it's important that, uh, that we understand the end because in this book, in just a minute, he's going to say that God intends to bless you and I through what he's revealed to us in the book of Revelation. And yet a lot of times we shy away from it, we back up from it, but in a minute we'll see that God intends to bless us and intends to give us the end. And if you could tell, if you knew next year where the stock market would be, which right now we don't know where the stock market will be the very next day, depending on whose tariffs, you know, <laughs> the whole chaos of it all, right? But if you could tell, if you knew exactly where it was going to be next year, you would be filthy rich next year, wouldn't you? Because if you knew this stock's going to go up 1,300%, that stock's going to drop 200%, you would be beg, begging and borrowing every dime you could get, right? Hey, I'll give you 25% on your money because you know the stock's going up. By next year this time, it'll be up 1,300%. You would be filthy rich. And it would change how you function today if you literally knew where the stock, at mark, stock market would be this time next year. God intends you do and I to be changed and to be blessed by knowing the end of the story, by knowing the end of the story. He intends for us to know where, where this is going and that knowing where it's going, that we would adjust our lives accordingly. Hmm. And so he reveals this to us. But I need to take just a minute to say, he says, and the things that must soon take place. Now, out of all of those out of all of those thousands of different ways of viewing the book of Revelation, I want to boil it down to a couple. And then I want to explain to you how we're going through it. There's really two main understandings of the book of Revelation. There's what's called the premillennial understanding of the book of Revelation. Millennium being a thousand years, pre being before, so Jesus returns and sets up a thousand year reign, pre millennial, and an amillennial view. 
Ah, is, so an ah millennial view takes this view that we are in the millennium, that it is an indefinite amount of time, and that what's being carried out now is part of God's millennial reign in the hearts of his people. So you have the premillennial and the ah millennial view. You have all kinds of myriads of other views out there. And maybe the one that uh, has given rise the most since the early 70s is the, uh, a view coming out of somewhat of an amillennial view, but I want to address it real briefly, is the preterist view. Preterist being Latin for uh, past. There is a, a view that says what was said in the book of Revelation was all finished in AD 70 when Nero ransacked God's people in Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and everything pertaining to it. Now, I want to say up front, you may hold to many different views, and it's not mine to attack any particular views. I just want to clarify for you where we're going and why we're t approaching it in a certain way. The, the issue is, as I've been reading the church fathers, by the church fathers, I mean those who were right after the apostle John, in fact, some of them, like Polycarp, was actually a disciple of the Apostle John, John being the final apostle alive. He discipled Polycarp, Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. These are some early church fathers. When we read soon, a lot of people assume that what was going to happen was going to happen immediately. And in fact, some would even assume that this had to take place at AD 70 so that this could be accomplished and that the events of AD 70 were actually the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. The problem with that is all the church fathers universally said that John was writing at the end of Domitian's reign. And this is important because in order for the events of this book to have been accomplished in AD 70, it had to be written during Nero's reign. And uh, because Domitian reigned from AD 81 to 96, that was well after the destruction of the temple. Here's what Irenaeus says. That the apocalyptic vision was seen not very long ago, almost in our own generation, Irenaeus says, at the close of the reign of Domitian. That was in his book Against Heresies, chapter 30. Victorinius he wrote the earliest commentary on the book of Revelation, also a church father. When John said these things, it was in the island of Patmos, condemned to the mines by Caesar Domitian, that he saw the apocalypse. Jerome, another church father, says this, in the 14th then after Nero, Domitian, having raised up a second persecution, he, John, was banished to the island of Patmos and wrote the Apocalypse. That is in his book, Lives of Illustrious Men, chapter 9. Others who wrote of the same thing, tagging John's writing to the end of Domitian's reign around roughly 95 or 96, include Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Eusebius. All of these say he wrote this at the end of Domitian's reign, roughly 95 or 96 AD. So you have this collective group of people saying he wrote this, and this has become so critical that he wrote it during 95 or 96, because what that means is all of these events are future. Are future. Now, some would say, well, it's internal evidence that we're pointing to, and they would look at Nero and say, hey, if you calculate his name, it comes out the number 666. But the only way Nero's name comes out 666 is, is to change it from its original writing from Greek into Hebrew, remove one of the letters, and then tack Caesar's name in front of Nero. Well, you're really pulling, you know, trying to make it say, jump through loops when you're doing all these changing to make it say something. What happens is the other thing they say, well, there's nothing in it that talks about the destruction of the temple. But remember, if all the early church fathers were right, it's been more than two decades since the destruction of the temple. And so the events in this book, looking future, are yet to be fulfilled. So then you end up with two views. 
The early church fathers were all universally premillennialists. They believed that soon Jesus would come back and set up a thousand year reign. Of course, we look at it and it's still future to us today, right? Or, uh, about 300 years later, Augustine switched from a premillennialist because by that time, a lot of premillennialists, they were painting it as though the, the, the millennial reign of Christ would usher in a time where we can gorge ourselves on food and live luxurious lives. And he was quite fed up with that. And he went with a view that was proposed by Origen. Now, Origen is a unique character in that this. He took the literal passages of scripture and then made allegorical interpretations. That is, that these physical events and stuff like that really point to an allegorical thing. There's a spiritual, deeper meaning, and that one, a person who is very mature could contemplatively come to understand the deeper spiritual meaning behind the events. And so, uh, going along with Origen, um, who took these basically physical things, these, um, these events in Revelation and said there's a spiritual reality that it's not a thousand years. He's actually talking about an undisclosed amount of time and a lot of the events in here become for him allegorical. That is a, a variety of spiritual things that could come from that or understandings. Um, in fact, Augustine or Origen, I should say, uh, believe many different things based out of his interpretation or his hermeneutic. He believed, for instance, that the pre-existence of souls, that uh, every soul had no beginning and has no end. And he also believed that eventually Origen believed that everyone, including the devil, would be saved. He had a lot of interesting views because in, instead of a literal interpretation of scripture, he took an allegorical interpretation. Augustine takes his view of the millennium and ultimately, that becomes the, the main understanding of eschatology or end times things all the way through the Reformation. So more than 12, 1300 years, the prevailing wind, prevailing way to understand eschatology or God's end times was the amillennial view. After that, in the last 400 years, the premillennial view of the early church fathers has again risen up. And both of these views have many splinter views, all kinds of different views. So you may be on anywhere on any of those spectrum, but I'm just saying that this, we're approaching it from the standpoint, I like how John MacArthur puts it. He says, if you approach your hermeneutic, and if you approach your understanding of, of the last book of the Bible, like you did the previous 65 books of the Bible, there's only one way to understand it, and it's premillennial. That is, you understand the Bible through your hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is how do we gain, how do we understand what the Bible is saying to us? And we really look at Jesus' life for that. When he looked at Adam and Eve, he literally believed that Adam and Eve were two literal people, right? So we look at Jesus and his hermeneutic, he understood things to be literal and very, when he talked about the flood, Jesus believed that the flood was a literal event that happened on this earth. So we look at how Jesus looked at the Old Testament and then we gain from that our hermeneutic, right? So MacArthur says, if you take the last book of the Bible and interpret it with the same hermeneutical approach as the first 65, you end up with some form of premillennialism. And a good uh, Presbyterian theologian basically said the same thing. And his argument was, yes, we are changing our hermeneutic or how we understand it for the last book of the Bible because of it being apocalyptic in nature. And so that would be the argument for those who would take it in a non-literal way. But for our study, and, and uh, we're sticking with the... Uh, the same hermeneutic that we have gone with this whole time. And so we end up as a church in a premillennial um, understanding of it. That isn't to say that um, it isn't a mark of our fellowship. There's all kinds of people who believe a lot of different things, and that's okay. Hopefully we'll all grow through this study. It isn't to say that we have it all ironed out and that all of the variety of, amongst all of the premillennial views there's a lot of different things because this is a notoriously difficult book. But I do want to note this. He says, 
chapter one, verse two, who testifies to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. I believe that God intends for all of his people to understand this book. I believe God intends to bless all his people for their understanding and heeding this book. I suspect there's a lot of Christians who are not receiving the blessing of this book, right? But I hope in my life and in your life as we're going through this book, we're praying our way through this book and asking ourselves, what is it that God wants me to understand and how can I heed a book that is completely difficult and at times it's turbulent, it's, it's got some crazy stuff going on in this book. But I believe that somehow God intends for us to know it, to understand it, to follow it, to believe it, and even obey this book by faith. So, interesting place. But the idea of the events that must soon take place has led, uh, it leads to some other questions, such as its parallel passage in Matthew 24. And, and uh, in Matthew 24, the whole chapter really is a parallel to Revelation. But in verse 34, and you can see why it's a difficult passage, he says, Matthew 24, 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. You say, well, clearly, since he didn't write this till 95 A.D., Jesus died in A.D. 30, 65 years has passed. This generation, we would look at and say, he must be applying it to the generation that sees the events and these signs and these wonders that come about. To that generation, they need to know that they will quickly see all these things unfold, right? And so some of the things that God wrote are very clear. When God prophesies that it would be 483 years from the declaration that he would rebuild, that actually the Messiah would come in from... 483 years after the declaration to rebuild Jerusalem, King Artaxerxes, remember Xerxes' son? Artaxerxes makes a decree. From that decree, 483 years later, happens to hit on an exact point in, in Christian history, in human history, which is what we call Palm Sunday. 483 years later. When God told them that you're going to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Guess what? It isn't an undetermined amount of time. 70 years later, in fact, they are overcome, the Babylonians, by the Persians and the prophecy in Isaiah 45.1 about Cyrus comes true. Who comes to power but a man named Cyrus of all people? just as God predicted 150 years earlier. So over and over, we have a self-authenticating God. And by self-authenticating, I mean that we are, do not have blind faith. We have informed faith. Informed faith means that we have our faith that's informed by the word of God. And this is what Isaiah 48.3 says. I declared the former things long ago. He says, long ago I told you this stuff. And they went forth from my mouth and I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted and they came to pass. That's prophecy, isn't it? God declaring the end from the beginning. God saying, listen up, because I'm telling you what's going to go down, and you need to know what's going to go down, because it'll affect your here and now. And typically, God's people go, yeah, yeah, that's nice, but I've, I've got bills to pay. I've got things to do. Well, you know, I've got this and that, right? So when it comes about, everyone's like, I can't imagine, like, all the prophecies of Jesus, and everyone's like, even John the Baptist is like, are you the one? Right? Yeah. There's, still, there's questions. Even in Matthew 28, just before the Great Commission, they meet up in Galilee, and they're up on the mountain, and, and it says, and some were rejoicing, and some were doubting, right? Even though he tells us to go meet me in Galilee. He actually meant meet him in Galilee. 70 years. He actually meant 70 years, 483 years. He, was, he actually meant 483 years. Who would have thunk it, right? Who would have guessed? I couldn't guess. So we see prophecy is the declaration of what's going to come to pass from long ago. Sometimes it's not all that clear. Remember when he says Elijah will come, they're like, didn't you say Elijah will come? And Jesus says, yes. And who did he point to? He says, John the Baptist came. 
spirit and power of Elijah. He came. You should have known that. And you're like, I should have known that. Yeah. I must have missed that one, right? I was out that day of class, right? So sometimes it's just not that clear. But prophecy is always the declaration of what's to come to his people long before he acts upon things to bring it to pass. And again, in the book of Revelation, when he says that God gave this, he's talking about prophecy. God gave this to John. Now, we live in a day where every lunatic runs around declaring a prophecy, right? Do you know what they did to prophets who didn't get it right in the Old Testament? They killed them, right? So you kind of had, okay, uh, go ahead, prophesy, and you had your guns in there, right? It was a little bit precarious. Clearly, there are prophecies given in the Bible that are very clear that God intends for us to know, and yet he, tend, he intends for us to be discerning in his regard to all of that goes on out there under the guise of prophecy, right? And then the Bible talks many times about all kinds of different reasons why people give prophecies that isn't from him. So we see that... Um, Verse 3, the blessing is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in them for the time is near. Clearly, when he talks about the time is near, since he wrote it during Domitian's reign, he's talking about the imminent return of Christ that we do not know when it will happen, but we know as these events start rolling and the snowball starts going that we need to be aware that they will roll quickly, right? All of these things will unfold quickly. All of these things will come about. And it's as though God's saying, hey, you don't know the time or the season, but I want you to live as though I'm going to return at any moment, right? And Jesus uses many parables to illustrate that very point. And so we're looking at this book and we're saying, man, there's this great blessing. But here's a strange thing. Do you know this is the only book in the Bible that begins that way? That you'll be blessed if you heed these things. But at the end of the book, he also offers a warning. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Um... He makes many disturbing warning calls of what would happen to a person if they took and distorted what he's saying in this final book of the Bible. And so you think of the variety of consequences. This morning, uh, my wife has, uh, my wife often will tell our daughter, okay, don't carry my phone around. I need my phone. And if it breaks, you don't want to have to pay to replace my iPhone, but Karis loves to listen to music, and it's all good Christian music. This morning, it drops, it hits the ground, Let me say, well, you do realize that you've been selling eggs and doing these things for years, and you just gave up all that money that you've been working for the last number of years. That's the consequence in buying her a new phone, right? Just a grievous time, right? It's sad. It was sad. I could tell her brother was like solemn and got in the truck, and we're all kind of like, how many chickens have you cared for for all these years? You know, how long have you been saving? And you just erased it all by dropping a phone. A phone that she needs for carrying on her work and her side business. And so you go, man, it was sad. But you know what's really sad? A person who doesn't get it right about Jesus. There are consequences. And it's not consequences that God hasn't told us about. In fact, it's consequences that God is very clear. He says, I'm going to bless you if you read and heed this book. But you mess up this book. And his consequence, he says, I'm going to mess you up. Paraphrasing. Read it for yourself. It's not too encouraging if you get it wrong, but it's very encouraging on the front end if you get it right. And so we want to approach it delicately. I'm not here to tell you that I understand all this book. I'm simply telling you that in light of the first 65 books of the Bible, I believe if we use that same hermeneutic to understand the last book of the Bible, there are clear points that we can understand, that we can take from this, and we can bank on. And there are other things that we can go... I don't know, but man, it's, it's going to be a wild ride at the end. 
and even though I like the Bible Project and their little videos on different books of the Bible and yada yada, there's some really good ones out there. The book of Revelation on that, I watched it, I was like, that's terrible, right? That's terrible. And basically, well, you could take it literally, but, you know, you could take it literally, but... You're going, wow, and that's typically how we approach this book. And it's understandable that it's difficult because all the other prophecies, we can see their fulfillment. But the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that is yet to see its fulfillment in all of these ways. Damien, you turn on the AC for us. It went from, it always does that, right? It goes from freezing cold to frying hot. But let's quickly just hit the last few verses this morning. And verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Are these literal, literal churches? They are literal churches, right? They're literal churches. There were seven churches John was writing to because John had, had had an impact in each one of those churches. So he writes to them this letter. So the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. We'll deal with seven spirits here next week more. But uh, it says grace to you and peace. That's really what all of us want, isn't it? That you don't have to worry. You're at peace with God. Well, how can I know I'm at peace with God? Because we often decide whether we're at peace with God by our emotions. You ever tried to do that? Like, I'm at peace with God. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm not at peace with God. You're like, it's only 2.35. That was five minutes ago that you were at peace with God. Ten minutes later, I'm at peace with God. Eight minutes later, I don't know. You're like, let me get this straight. Are you determining whether you are at peace with God by your emotions? That maybe if you speak, uh, what well, the last word you said, if it was said with the wrong tone, now you're, you're no longer at peace with God. You know what I mean? We tend to view everything through the lens of our emotions, but the Bible doesn't. Praise God. The Bible says, grace to you and peace. So God says, you're at peace. We're at peace. There's no war. There's no enmity. We're not separate. We're not at war. We're not at battle. There's no condemnation for you. You're, we're at peace. You just need to rest in that, right? And there's grace. That is, I wonder if God's with me. I wonder if God still loves me. I mean, do I have to be perfect to get God's grace? The idea of grace is that it's not for perfect people. Perfect people would merit grace, right? You say, oh, man, you're so perfect. You get Grace is that you didn't earn it, right? So this book is a, he starts off from the, from the one who has always existed, who exists currently right now. Like literally, there's a throne room with a God in it, and God who Jesus seated on the throne is also one with the Father, and this God being that we call God encompasses the entire universe, and yet right now, he is being worshipped by angels, and he is being looked on, and this same God who right now is being worshipped by angels and looked on will always exist in the future too, and he has said that he will take all those who by faith accept the gift of eternal life that he offered through Jesus Christ, and we too will always exist going future. So he says, it's from him, he says, grace and peace, and that's important when you go into a book that is anything but peaceful. Hollywood could never even come up with the craziness in here. And yet, a lot of times I look at the Hollywood type stuff, and I'm like, wow, like you ripped that off in the Bible, man. Asteroids hitting and this and that. I'm like, hey, you guys need to stop reading Revelation and making money off of us and then twisting the story, right? It's like, I get it. I read this book. So there is craziness in here. But verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So he got up from the dead, never went back. And all who follow him will get up from the dead and they'll never die again, right? And the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and, and released us from our sins by his blood. Do you feel released from your sins this morning? If you're banking on these things by faith rather than by your emotion, you can say, I've been released from my sins. Like literally, you could sit here and go, I'm completely guiltless before a holy God. And your spouse could be like, you're right. You would need to repent. But you could literally say, I'm released from all my sins. Like he literally absorbed them all and I am in the sight of God. My position is perfection. That should motivate a life of holiness, by the way, not this sort of sense, well, I'm just going to keep working until I feel, man, if you're working to feel like, I'm going to work till I feel loved by God, 
Like, I'm glad I'm not you, right? That is not fun, right? Living an emotion-driven life, basing your relationship with God on your feelings is like being a hamster on one of these treadmills, right? You just run harder, harder, faster, faster. You go, rest. Bank on the fact that what God says is true, that you're at peace, that he has already released you from all your sins, that you already have eternal life, and then start living out of your new identity. You are already beloved of God. You have his favor. You have peace with God. Now start living, right? And he has made us to be a kingdom priest. We'll end in verse 6. I plan to go further, but we'll end here. And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. So he has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to our God the Father. Now, when you run into someone who says they're a priest, you typically think of them wearing an outfit you'd never want to be caught dead in and, uh, you know, going through a bunch of rituals. Because when Jesus tore the veil in two, there was no longer a need for the priesthood. He actually made it so that every believer is a priest to God. So what does a priest do? A priest took the concerns of people before a holy God. Jesus says now that we can approach the throne of God with boldness, that every one of us are a priest unto God. Now, we could be faithful priests taking the needs of the people around us to the throne of God and saying, God, would you please move in this? God, would you please answer this? God, and we can bring the needs of the people to God, and we can bring God's word to the people as priests. Every man and woman and child that is of God's household is now a priest. So there's not an official role of priest. And so pastor is not like, oh, you're the pastor. That's really elevated. No, pastor is just a servant, right? Just a servant like any other servant. It's just a different role of servant. But the priest, all of us are priests. And so we need to say, if I'm a priest, am I a faithful priest? Am I faithful to take this truth that the sins of man were resolved at the cross, that man has peace and grace from God? Am I faithful to bring these truths to people? Am I faithful to encourage them? In the end, God wins. And whether even if we get done with this series and you totally disagree with this eschatology, it's okay. We agree on two things. God wins in the end, and we should be telling people this amazing gospel message because even though things look normal and everyone's going down and buying a car today and shopping and going out to eat today, it'll be a day like this that Jesus returns, the scripture says. Make no mistake about it. It won't be that much different from today. All we need to know is there is a day. Jesus is coming back. He does win in the end. And if you look around at all the injustices, go, oh, nothing's ever going to change. You can look at Revelation and go, no, God's going to change it in a big way. He is going to rain justice on all the injustice of this world. God is going to rain down in this world. He says the king, he is the king over the kings. He is even currently above every president and every king on this earth. And he is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And while it doesn't look like it now, it it will look like it and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is indeed, was indeed, has always been Lord of the entire universe, creator of all things and the one to whom all mankind needs to do business. And the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation stands as a testimony that we need to plead with all mankind to do business with our loving Father because he is long-suffering and patient. But at the very end, when his long-suffering and his patience is over, so is mankind. Let's pray and take communion. Father, we come. We recognize that this book uniquely offers us a blessing. But we also stand in a level of fear that this book also offers very serious consequences. Lord, I know that you intend for us to understand your ways. You intend to share with us what's to come. I pray as a congregation, as we pray through these things, we would understand more clearly what is to come. Lord, I pray that through this we would receive the blessing that you intend for us to understand. And that our lives would be marked by the knowledge of your return, of your soon return of your imminent return. In fact, there's nothing that's going to hamper or hinder that return. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Everything finds its fulfillment in you. And we are coming before your throne, seeking your forgiveness and 
Lord, as we take communion, and we're wanting to celebrate that you alone are worthy, that you alone are holy, that you alone have accomplished redemption for mankind, and you alone are the creator and sustainer of mankind. So even while we zoom around this galaxy on this ball today, we recognize that all of it is from you. Even it's sustained, that it's sustained right now is from you. And we want to glorify you with our lives. Please forgive us. We thank you again for accomplishing on the cross what we could never have done. And soon enough, we will all make that leap of death. And then our faith will become sight. We won't need faith. We will be in your presence. And all these truths will become the fullness of what our reality is. And we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.